between in economics. <laughs> uh, we might be, need to, uh, to make it this a bit quick because I think these are quite simple stuff that you can learn for yourself. It's a basic iteration of what you've learned in school, what you've learned in classes, with a slightly different um, languages and maybe additional elements. Again, like before this, we mentioned what demand is about the basic thing, but I don't think it adds to it. Or more, 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 or more likely, or uh, more clearly to say, it's modern economics abandoned it. So, reading Adam Smith is trying to remind that there are more than just demand and supply, and there are more other, other things that Adam Smith mentioned that maybe <coughs> our modern economic study has neglected. Okay, so there are three components. When we mentioned about the natural prices, there are natural wage, natural rate of profits, and there are natural rate of uh, rent. Natural rent, really. So, let's look at natural wages. It's basically average wages, in a way. So we have a certain period of time, say again, like, like I said, January to August, accumulate all the wages uh, in that particular industry, you don't get the natural wages, you get the average wages. Simple as that. And uh, I just need to make a distinction between the real wages and the nominal wages. Okay, this distinction does not exist to be uh, added in the modern economics today. Why? Because back in those days, uh, wages comes in monetary terms, but the value of the money that they give is depending on the, the price of the coins. You see? So, if, uh, I'll explain to you later, but um, back today, um, when you give like 10 ringgit wages, it's 10 ringgit, that's it. But the way they decide the, the wages back in those days is by looking at the price of coins. Because they assume the wages, uh, the labors, the basic uh, foods that they have, they eat is the coins, and the bread, anyway. So when the bread, when the when the bread price, the price of the bread increases, the wages have to increase as well. Same time. So the real wages is trying to look at the, the it's not to look at the relative value of the wages to the to the corn. It's looking at the wages in itself. It's, it's okay. Just bear, just bear in mind that when you mentioned about nominal price of labor or the nominal wages, he was talking about price with respect to the corn price, wages with respect to the corn price. Okay, again, uh, average wage, simple. Uh, Will uh, Open Smith, it's okay, it's very interesting. I thought it's Will Smith. Uh, because it looks like a Will Smith. Like that? Notice, notice, huh? Okay, um, you wrote, it's okay. Uh, uh, it's a uh, open. <laughs> the books are, uh, Smith opened it by suggesting first the abandoned farming theory, which employees have, have the advantages. Uh, so, when uh, the relationship between the, uh, the laborers and also the employers is that employers, according to Smith, have advantages. It's not, again, it's trying to debunk the, the demand and supply idea of, uh, of uh, in the modern economics today. Because in modern economics today, uh, it's basically even depending on labor, uh, demand and supply of laborers, then you get the, the, the wages. As if like, both are basically on the equal side of the, of the spectrum. But according to Smith, reality, Reality, um, practically speaking, it's not the case, and he acknowledges it. He said, if you want employers, you can push the wages down to any level. Uh, there's a minimum wage. There's a minimum wage that he said that you can put any wages uh, as long as it actually doesn't go beyond the subsistence wages. These are the things, the other concept that you have to remember. Subsistence wages, what are the WS, subsistence wages, is the minimum wages where the laborers be able to reproduce itself. So what I'm trying to say is this. It's for example, for, for example, I mean, good of half. You guys understand it. I have explained it. Okay. The minimum wages is that it's it's a basic wages that allow the, the laborers to produce itself means to be able to survive for that particular day or that particular month. So when you have a 10 wage uh, 10 laborers in that particular community, if you put that particular wages, after one month, there's still 10. There's no like nine. Because one died, Katale uh, Makan. That's basically the, 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 the whole point. It's a minimum wages where they'll be able to reproduce the same number uh, uh, the very next day. Also, there's no growth of population. <coughs> that is, that it's good enough to support at least one child. Manikala, for this particular era, you have 10,000 10, neighbors with the same particular wages. 
After that particular error, it's basically the same number. They are reproducing the same number. Your, maybe your father died, but your son will continue. It's not going to increase any. It's not going to actually increase any, 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 any numbers of labors, lah. Because in, according to classical economy, when you have when you have higher wages, you tend to produce more. Then you see when you have higher wages, you tend to have more kids because you can afford to have more kids. You see. So this minimum wages is that you cannot have more than one kid. Please, you're going to produce the same numbers in every era throughout your life. So that's clear, I hope. So the natural wages in this analogous variable, the semi system, determined by the difference between labor demand and labor supply. So again, natural wages is actually like the natural prices, is the interaction between labor demand and supply. The natural price, uh, natural, natural wages, usually going to be the also the subsistence wages back in those days. It can only increase beyond the subsistence wages if uh, the growth of uh, labor demand must exceed the rate of growth in labor supply. Okay. This can you understand this? The rate of growth of labor demand must exceed the rate of growth of labor supply. Only then, the natural wage or the equivalent wage can increase permanently above the subsistence wages. Anybody do you understand this particular sentence? I can show you the diagram form. Do it. Found it. Fahim that. I know it's a reply. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Sorry, my Arabic is bad. Fahim too. Mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, for so I mean, there are subsistence wages. There are minimum wages. So, I just want to say that this system, the system of natural liberty, must allow uh, for the labor demand to grow more than the, the growth of labor supply, so that the wages will be increasing. That is, when there are more demands for labor than supplies, there will be increasing wages, isn't it? It's basically demand, demand and supply mechanism. But so the economy must constantly grow in, in this particular system. To make sure that the demand, the growth for the demands for the labor keep on increasing, and it must increase in the rate higher than the labor supply is increasing, because when you are increasing the when they are increasing labor demand, they are increasing wages, isn't it? When they are increasing wages, what's going to happen? There's an increase in labor supply, because when increase wages, people are going to reproduce more. Yeah. When you are basically a family, you have higher wages, you're going to produce, uh, you're going to have more kids. When you have more kids, you're going to increase the labor supply. So it's going to go back to the natural prices, natural wages. So for the for the wages to constantly increases, increases, it must have a constant growth of labor demand that is higher than the growth of labor supply. That's the whole point of the theory. And Adam Snow is saying this systems actually supported that. If you follow the system going to Smith, this will happen, and in the long run, the wages of the workers will be. Slowly increasing and better and better from the subsistence wages, from the minimum wages. And uh, ironically, that's not the case in the real world. So Anderson was wrong, really. Uh, anybody who studied the American economy realized that uh, the, the, the wages for labor in America never increases in the 1970s. So okay, these are the again will be criticized by Ricardo later, but at least. Adam Smith wholeheartedly believed that if you are following the system, the, uh, the price of the wages will be increasing in the long run. And that would be a good thing for the workers. Uh, okay, natural rate of profits is basically the average rate of profits. Uh, again, ignore the Ricardo theory part, because we're going to actually learn that again later. Okay, this is important. Okay. Smith's dominant argument is that the natural rate of profits is determined by the competition of capitals via two mechanisms. So the growth of profits, obviously, when you are basically, you know, in a business, your profits must not be in the same level. Every year there must be a certain growth of profits, isn't it? So your growth of profits, if you are selling a certain product, depending on two things. The first one is the output market. Capitalists will compete by increasing output. So when you increase output, what's going to happen? When there's increase in the price, will go down. the price will go down. Yes, the price will go down. Uh, when, you, when the price goes down, what's going to happen to the profits? Yes. Less profits. So, 
the, the, therefore squeeze profits from above. So in a very long run, actually, according to the system of natural liberty, <coughs> a capitalist will be competing against each other to produce more outputs. When there are more outputs, the price will be lower. And when the price are, uh, the price are lower, the profit will be squeezed. Will be lower, in a way, because you have to reduce the prices and the, the chunk of the profits from the prices is going to be lower. And again, you can't actually uh, take the, you can't actually reduce the price of the wages because they are minimum. If you reduce beyond, beyond the, below the sufficient wages, the labor is going to die, or at least they refuse to work. So there's a, in a very long run, according to Smith, is that uh, profits growth can reduce from five percent to maybe four point nine percent, four point eight percent. So that until, uh, okay, he never said till zero, uh, but he explained later. But in a very general sense, it's going to reduce. That's the first one, the first mechanism. The second mechanism is that, according to Smith, is that when, when there's not increase in output, what do you do? When you are trying to increase more outputs, you're going to hire more? Yeah. Yeah. More labors. When there are more labors, yeah, uh, when you hire more labors, it means there are more demand for labors, right? Yeah. What's going to happen when you're demanding more labors? Yeah. There's an increase in wages. Again, this will squeeze the profit from below. So there are two forces in the in the long run. In the long run, it's going to actually affect the profits, the rate of the growth of profits. The first one is if you increase more outputs, lower prices, squeeze more profits, it's going to reduce the profits. And also, when you try to produce more outputs, you're going to increase the labor demand, and at the same time, you're going to actually uh, yeah, reduce more profits there because you have to pay more to for the workers for their wages. That's clear. But again, capitalists, if you you are a capitalist, you're not going to be happy with it, isn't it? You are quite sad about it. What? What is it? I'm not going to follow the system. But Spina said, don't worry. Don't worry. Because. Okay, let's just go. Okay, I explain <laughs> Because um, the profit, if you look at the profits, the growth of profit is actually uh, reducing. But they said the revenue is increasing. You know what that is? So, because you Growth again is a very relative thing, depending on the whole uh, uh, revenue that you get. So even though the growth are decreasing, you know, but still the revenues are increasing. It's a kind of an irony there, you know, because the percentage might decrease. The percentage of the, uh, of the profits from the whole production might decrease, uh, might decrease, but still because you produce more, you're still going to get more revenues. You know. But in a very declining manner, but still better than, the, 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 better than before. You know. But again, he was suggesting a very interesting thing. He was actually hinting at certain things here. Uh, maybe he didn't realize it, but these systems can never sustain itself. This was this uh, this was seen by Marx. If you are, even though it's, it's a lo in the long run, we are approaching zero profits, zero growth, growth of profits. Meaning we are one point at a time, in a very long, long run. I mean, the long, long. Uh, one point of a time uh, uh, ahead of us, there will be a time where economies or capitalists will be in a business where there are no growth of profits at all. They're still going to get the revenue. But they're going to get the revenue for, uh, the same with last year. I mean, they know there's no growth in a way. And following the same logic here, I mean, so you can explain even further, in which Marx actually realized something's wrong here, uh, is. Um, if you are continuously increasing output, you are basically draining the natural resources. Because the logic dictates that you have to constantly increase output. Constantly increase output. According to Marx, okay, then wait a minute, you are doing that, that we are actually in a very dangerous situation. Then somebody gets somebody, somebody who criticizes Marx and say, it's okay, we have technology to back us up. So by introducing the same technology, we're going to increase more chances, more kind of a new space for natural resources, if you like. But again, Marx was saying, which one is stronger? Is technology have a greater influence in making this constant accumulation of wealth and constant growing of the economy? Uh, with? Again, I'm trying to say, if you, you, know, you introduce technology, it might save us, but how how technology gonna catch? Uh, how how technology gonna be able to save us in a very long run? Are they be able to catch up the development of the economy? In a way, or in the end, we running out of ideas. We can't think of any technology anymore. 
tentatively, we just keep on draining our resources till we die. Till we get to the Elysium state of the world. Watch Elysium? Yeah, yeah it's, yes. it's the worst place to live in. Uh, in, in a way. So, in fact, we are actually approaching that at the moment. In fact, the, the discussions of uh, environmental climate change is really worrying. Some, some scientists would even think that maybe we are already too late. I, I'm not going to show you a video, but I think I'm going to video. Uh, but <laughs> it's going to take five minutes. Uh, is it okay? It's okay. It's okay, yes. You guys are bad. <laughs> okay, I'll try to find a video first. Then, then. Can you make an analogy that might help us understand? 
Sure. Um, it's as if you're sitting in your car uh, in your garage with the engine running and the door closed and you've slipped into unconsciousness. Okay. That's it. What if someone comes and opens the door? You're already dead. What if the person got there in time? Maybe you'd be sick. Okay. So now what's the CO2 equivalent of the getting there in time? Shutting off the car 20 years ago. You sound like you're saying it's hopeless. Yeah. Is that the uh, administration's position or yours? There isn't a position on this anymore that there's a position on a temperature at which water boils. The administration, let me try to, your administration. And don't forget, I need to stretch. Solar, clean coal, nuclear power, raising fuel economy standards, and building a more efficient electrical grid. Yes. And that would have been great. Let's see if we can't find a better spin. People are starting their weekends. The report says we can release 565 more gigatons of CO2 without the effects being cleaned up. It says we can only release 565 gigatons. So what if we only release 564? Well, then we would have a reasonable shot at some form of dystopian post-apocalyptic life. But the carbon dioxide in the oil that we've already released is 2,795 gigatons. So. What would all this look like? Well, mass migrations, food and water shortages, spread of deadly disease, endless wildfires, way too many to keep under control, storms that have empowered level cities, blacking out the sky, and create permanent darkness. Are you going to get in trouble for saying this publicly? Who cares? Mr. Westbrook, <laughs> we want to inform people, but we don't want to alarm them. Can you give us a reason to be optimistic? Well, that's the thing, Will. Americans are optimistic by nature. And if we face this problem head on, if we listen to our best scientists and act decisively and passionately, I still don't see any way we can survive. Okay, Richard Westbrook, Deputy Assistant Administrator of the EPA. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. This is Newsnight. We'll be back right after this. All right. <laughs> it's, it's a, a, a newsroom. TV show. It's really interesting you can see. You see a lot of commentaries on current issues in a parody kind of a manner. So, okay, back to the boring side um, of the lecture. So, again, okay, we are trying to talk about like, how the growth or the constant growth that was promoted by capitalism or free market systems. At the very heart of it, free market must dictate that capitalists or merchants or businessmen must follow the logic of growth. If you stop growing, the economy stops functioning, in a way. But again, what, uh, what again we're going to look at Marx's criticism of this is that if, if it's, there's a constant growth economy, there's a constant increasing in output, what's going to happen to the world? So, yeah. Maybe, any, yeah? Disaster. Disaster, okay, that's true. But again, I, uh, I remember there's a free market. So, what is, at uh, one point, I think my uh, last class, I think I remember uh, somebody who, again, the argument to counter is, uh, according to the free market believer, is that humans are always great. If you look at history, there are major climate changes that have happened, isn't it? There's an ice age, there's a meteor, we don't exist back then, but nonetheless, uh, there's a climate changes, there's a lot of other, uh, there's a disaster, there's a war, there's a, a flood going on a lot, to a lot of places. But we still survive. So there's a kind of optimism that suggests that maybe, just maybe, we'll survive another one more crisis, which could be true. But again, that's a, that's a kind of a very risky belief to, to hold on to. And some would say technology will be able to, to help us out. Again, if you believe in that, it's, it's OK. It's up to you. Again, it's the job of the scientist now. It's, who are the scientists here? There's no scientists here. It's okay then. It's not our responsibility anymore. <laughs> we don't have a crash. Uh, anyway, but let's, let's put our hope to the scientists now to see what we like. Um, the best that we can think of is, uh, at least according to the scientists now, we're going to actually enter a very strange era where maybe um, oxygen becomes a commodity because it's so rare to get enough. Pure oxygen. I think we already have now. Yeah. Uh, oxygen as a. China. Yeah. And maybe that's the future. And imagine the future where every day you have to live, you have to work, to literally live. 
So just to eat any freeze and one hour of fresh air. Sir, I remember I watched an animation movie called. Oh, yeah, I know what it is. They used to say. The Lawrence. Yeah? The Lawrence. Yes. Animation movie. Okay. What's the title again? Okay, it's a class discussion, right? <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's the name again? Lorex. Lorex. Yes. It's very hard. R-E. Okay, I'm going to Google it later. <laughs> I'm going to send you. Uh, somebody WhatsApp the WhatsApp group. Uh, are you WhatsApp the WhatsApp group? Uh, well, I'll keep it there. Uh, it's, it's, maybe it's, a, it's a, one of the our members suggested this particular movie. We can watch it and see. Yeah. Try to imagine so what kind of world we're going to live in if we continue yeah, really. to follow this law of growth for, for eternity. Okay. So, yeah. Even the trees in the movie, even the trees in the movie are artificial. It's very nice movie. Even it's anime. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's anime. Nonetheless, anyway, it's a good movie to practice. Yeah. There's another movie that I think uh, I'll, I'll put in anime now once I put it But again, that's the natural of the Okay, so let me. Yeah. Uh, did Alistair actually suggest that uh, one that, say, we, we have three kind of um, uh, resources? Resources, yeah. Uh, Land, capital. Huh. So, uh, did he suggest that one that owns capital cannot, uh, I mean, cannot remove himself from being the uh, capitalist, and one who owns the lands cannot remove himself from being the landlords? Because when we talk about quantum gohar, right, if they can utilize the resources uh, according to what they deem to be better, right, uh, then they can opt to go out from the market. And uh, instead, be uh, labor, let's say. Okay, that's 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 true. I mean, he never see that. But it, because he makes his assumption, his assumptions that um, everybody in this particular system is working on self-interest kind of a way. That is that um, because you're not gonna think in a because human nature, at least the way I see, it, you're not gonna think in a late, like, in a larger future. Like, you know, the next next generation, you're really going to survive at least for the world. See, you went to become a labor. You know, you know, you know if you are the only one to become a labor, you're going to be the one to be oppressed. And you know, you might not be able to make it a day in that particular lifetime. So, it's, it's, uh, you, so once you're a capitalist, maybe it's going to be a capitalist. Because you'll be able to survive yourself and not become a labor. Because labor, labor life of the labor is quite miserable. But at the same time, also, if you are becoming a capitalist, you have to follow the same logic like, like others, that you have to compete. When you, are, when you have to compete, one of the things you compete is by increasing more hours, try to get the best prices, try to, get, try to control the largest market in the world for you to be able to survive. Because if you don't, if you are basically just, okay, let's just have a constant growth. If you're the one that actually do it, you're the only one that do it, you're gonna be left out in the market. There's a thing, uh, uh, Nokia. You know what happened to Nokia? Yes. He did. He failed. He, they failed to catch up. But again, in the in the, in the cool world of free market, not cool up, but it's a, it's a basic thing. The world of competition is that if you don't catch up, uh, you're gonna be left out. Somebody gonna take over. Then you become a labor, which is again, it's a very scary thing to be. So again, we are trapped in a system, maybe that somehow put us to a certain roles and characters and behaviors that we can't really escape. Not to be pessimistic, but I guess that's what, at least uh, how I see it, I would say how some of the philosophers in the Europe see it. We'll, we'll go to that later, but that's the logic of it in a way. So, okay, but Smith never, never really imagined that it's going to be the end of the world. Because again, the scale of the industry at the time is not as large as it be, isn't it? Of course, he thinks that yeah, it's, it's, but it's going to be, it's going to happen maybe in the next three or four thousand, five thousand years. But what they feel to, what they feel to see is that technology progress and market progress and commodity production progress in a very rapid manner. 
that we cannot imagine till day. It's so rapid. In fact, now I think I was talking about uh, this is 3D printing now. Right. Okay, imagine. Okay, I'm just going to throw you some certain utopian ideas. Imagine that everyone have 3D printings, they can produce anything now. What are the things that are going to be sold in the market anymore? 